Hi, Hub Groups. Um, this is the next uh, talk or introduction in the series on Old Testament prayer. And uh, I'm going to be um, introducing the prayer of Nehemiah today. Um, so I'm going to read some little sections from um, the first chapter of Nehemiah and then the main prayer that Nehemiah prays. So um, just to give a bit of backstory to it, um, the people, God's people of, of Israel have been exiled in Babylon for um, 70 years and eventually some of them have been allowed to go back and start to rebuild the temple, which they have done. And um, by the time our story starts, um, Nehemiah is working um, for the king of Babylon as a cupbearer um, and he receives a call from God to go back to Jerusalem to rebuild the walls and his prayer that we're going to look at today is really all around that um, event. So um, I'll leave you to read the main bulk of the chapter um, in your hub groups but I just wanted to point out a few things um, about prayer as, as I as I see them and as I got out of this chapter when I was looking at it. Um, so the first thing I feel is that there is so much in this chapter about so many different types of prayer um, and you feel that when you're um, reading this story that you've kind of come into the middle of a long-standing um, love that Nehemiah has for his people and for his homeland and for um, a, a passion for to see all the things that God has promised those people to come to pass. So you feel that this is like a long ongoing prayer that um, has been prayed over over a long time. So at the beginning of the story, uh, one of Nehemiah's brothers comes back from Jerusalem and uh, tells him, gives him a report of what's been happening. And it's bad news, unfortunately. And um, in verse three, it says, um, his brother says to him um, about the people who are in Jerusalem, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. Um, so there's no, the, the city has no protection against enemies. It's completely vulnerable. And even though there are people living there, um, it's really in a very, very bad state. Um, and Nehemiah is so distressed by this um, that it says in, in verse four, um, when I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Um, and I just love this because um, it, I just feel like there's so much uh, pain and anguish in Nehemiah at this point that he, he feels for his people um, and for his homeland, that his only response is to fast, to pray and to mourn. Um, and, you know, I just feel sometimes there's things that happen to us or things that we hear about that are so distressing that it's not like we have to um, we have to try we have to think oh what should I do now oh I know I better fast it's like that's our natural response our natural response is we want to do something we want to express um, our agony to God we want to express our prayers to God in ways maybe that there are no words to say and I feel like this is what Nehemiah is doing at this point. He's praying, but he's mourning and fasting. Um, and then he, this, this prayer that he prays is recorded. And I just want to read um, this prayer because I think there's so much in it. Um, he sa it says, O Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and obey his commands, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. 
I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's house, have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly towards you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees and laws you gave your servant Moses. Remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even if your exiled people are at the farthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. They are your servants and your people, whom you redeemed by your great strength and your mighty hand. O Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favour in the presence of this man. And um, that's kind of the ending of the prayer. Um, So... I just feel like um, there's lots of times in this prayer where Nehemiah um, is reminding God of things, um, and I I kind of I kind of like that as a as a way of approaching prayer, and I think that it's so often about when we do that when we remind God about things, we're reminding um, ourselves too. So the prayer starts with. Um, Nehemiah reminding God of who he is. He's saying, Lord, you are great and awesome. You keep your covenant of love. It's saying, this is who you are, Lord. This is your character. This is your, this is your nature. You are a covenant keeping God. You are a promise keeping God. And that's such a good way to start um, our prayers, I think, to remind ourselves and to declare who God is. And, um, and Nehemiah says that he's depending on God. He's depending on God to hear his prayers. He knows that he hasn't got anywhere else to go. There's nothing he can do um, to to help his people or to save his people. He's completely dependent on God. Um, And the other thing I really like is the way that he um, he reminds God about the covenant that he's been that has been made, the promises that that um, God has made to the people. He says, remember the instructions you gave to your servant Moses. And it goes on and on and on in that um, little section there. And he's quoting Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 30, if you want to look that up in your hub groups. Um, And really just um, reminding God that his promises that he made to his people have not yet been fully completed. They've been partially completed. Nehemiah can see that, but they haven't been fully completed. And he's saying to God, I know there's more to this. I know there's more to your promises than what we've seen already. I know that this is only part of what you want for us as a people. And um, yeah, the thing that strikes me about that is first of all, that Nehemiah knows the promises of God. And that he's not shy about asking God for um, a more full um, realisation of those promises. I think that's amazing. Um, And then he goes on to remind God again about who his people are. He's already reminded them of uh, of who who God himself is. But he says, these are your people. These are your servants. You've redeemed them by your great strength and your mighty hand. So you've already done so much for these people in the past don't give up now, don't stop now, keep working, keep dealing with them, keep progressing um, them forward as a nation. Um, And then um, the whole thing crystallises in this one little tiny request that Nehemiah is making personally. And it's like, um, at this point, it's revealed to us that God has been giving Nehemiah a calling all the way through. It's actually four months later by the time Nehemiah goes to the king and asks the king to let him go back um, and help to rebuild the walls. And um, this calling that Nehemiah has been receiving, I think, has been happening over this whole period of time. But the thing that Nehemiah specifically asks God to do is to help him to speak to the king to give him favour in, in the 
sight of the king when he speaks to him. And that's like one little thing. Nehemiah has to, he knows he has to take that step, that next step. And it's that one thing he has to do, which is going to move him forward into this calling that God has been downloading to him over this four months. Um, and then just quickly, I think it's I think it's so great again in in um, chapter two, when he does go to see the king and the king says, oh, why are you sad, Nehemiah? And he says, oh, um, you know, my people are suffering. And the king says, what do you want? And then Nehemiah says, then I pray to the God of heaven and I answered the king. Um, and then he tells the king. And I think that's like an example of a Lord, help me now prayer that when he's in the moment, he's had four months of praying. He's had this long period of fasting and mourning and grieving over the state of of his people. And now he just sends up this tiny little prayer. Lord, help me now to speak um, in that second before he he is going to say the words. And um, yeah, I think I think there's so much that we can see here about so many different types of prayer. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I think in your in your groups, I'm sure you can explore some of these things. But um, yeah, I love this. I love this whole story. And um, I pray that you'll just be blessed as you read it and think about it and think about how um, it applies to us. Um, on our own individually and to us as a church. Okay, bye.